welcome everyone to the inaugural Rules as Code 2.0 Global Plenary, co-hosted by the Future Law Network of the Australasian Society for Computers and the Law, the UNSW Allen's Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation. Both our organisations are focused on the grand challenges which arise at the intersection of law, technology and society, bringing together leaders across disciplines to educate and contribute to policy development aligned, amongst other things, to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. On behalf of all joining today, I acknowledge and pay respect to the First Nations people from the many lands from which we gather from across the globe. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us from Australia and New Zealand. For tens of thousands of years, the First Nations people valued the importance of community, of sharing stories and wisdom, and it is in that spirit that we meet today. My name is Maruni Yastrabalf and I'm the President of AUSCL. Today's event follows from a highly successful Future Law Masterclass series, attracting over 3,000 registrations, and responds to a call for community and discussion beyond RAC 101. We have three parts to the plenary. A keynote and opening address, then five parallel roundtable uh, sessions, followed by a town hall discussion to bring together the learnings and closing remarks. An exceptionally ambitious but exciting agenda. Today we have two co-conveners, Natalia and Lyria. Natalia is a distinguished fellow of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law. She's a legal innovator, legal design specialist, and seasoned lawyer, having held many senior leadership roles within the global professional consulting and law environment, including as APAC Law, Innovation and Technology Leader at EY Law, and in-house as General Counsel for an e-commerce startup and APAC Legal Counsel for a multinational ERP software vendor. Natalia leads our Future Law Network and is the visionary behind the Masterclass series mentioned earlier, which is focused on rules as code, smart legal contracts, and compliance by design. She's a, a multi-award winning digital transformation and legal operations uh, leader. Uh, her team has also won numerous awards in relation to AI and its application to regulatory compliance. And now for Lyria. Lyria is the director of the Allen's Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation, and a Professor and Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Law and Justice, co-lead and of Law and Policy Dean at the Cyber Security Cooperative Research Centre and Faculty Lead in the UNSW Institute for Cyber Security. Lyria is a, a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law and a member of many influential committees and editorial boards. Thank you, Marina. On behalf of the Australasian Society for Computers and Law, Future Law Network, and my co-convener, Professor Lyria Bennett-Moses, welcome to our inaugural Rules as Code Global Plenary, Rules as Code 2.0. To commence proceedings, I will address three whys. Firstly, why this plenary? Our mission today is twofold to connect the global RAC community and bring together our voices to co-create key design elements for Rules as Code 2.0. Rules as Code lies at the intersection of law, technology and society. Its impact transformational and the opportunities and challenges unprecedented. Rules as Code projects are being deployed now in multiple jurisdictions. Our challenge is to ensure that RAC delivers overwhelmingly positive outcomes by design, respectful of our fundamental common values, the rule of law, democracy, human rights, inclusion, access to justice. Multidisciplinary teaming is key and public-private collaboration is required to deliver sustainable outcomes. How do we create a hybrid rules as code workforce? Interoperability, are technical standards required? These are but some of the issues that will be explored during our roundtable sessions. Now, why you? You were invited for the contribution you can make to this discussion. You are joined today by colleagues from across the globe, multiple disciplines and sectors, diverse skill sets, perspectives and experiences. From startups to regulators and big tech, legislative drafters, lawyers, project managers, 
data scientists, technologists, and importantly, philosophers and ethicists. Now, why this format? Today's format is designed to facilitate both collaboration and output. We're not looking for solutions. With five roundtables, multiple grand challenges, and only three hours, this is an ambitious plan, and it is likely that we'll have more questions than answers. Your challenge today is to help identify the pressing issues, pressing issues that will need to be addressed in the design of Rules as Code 2.0. Each roundtable will produce a canvas capturing key insights and recommendations, including areas of agreement, divergence and potential ambiguities. These roundtable canvases will be combined and distributed later. Keep curious and enjoy collaborating. Now we'll hear from our distinguished speakers, Mireille and Pia. Professor Heidelbrandt Mireille, if I may, joins us from the university, the Free University, Brussels. Mireille is Research Professor on Interfacing Law and Technology, an exceptionally prolific author with over four scientific monographs, 22 edited volumes and special issues, and over 100 chapters and articles. Mireille is a leading global theorist on technology and the rule of law. Mireille's most recent book, Law for Computer Scientists and Other Folk, is highly acclaimed. It was published last year. Mireille, thank you for joining us today. I'll now hand over to you. Well, thank you very much for this invitation, especially knowing that I am a rather contrarian thinker, not a strong advocate of rules as code, but a grounded advocate of constructive distrust because I think that is key to both science and the rule of law. Now, I am deeply impressed with the rules as code movement, and I'm convinced that there is a momentum at this moment that should be acted upon. <clears throat> what are some of the problems that we are facing in the law? Well, first of all, I think that legislative initiatives are overwhelming. Basically, there are too many rules, both legal rules and policy rules. I think we should note that uh, both citizens and corporations will often lack access to the policy rules <clears throat> that have usually been developed internally within the public administration to make decisions based on their interpretation and discretion. And interpretation and discretion are both key to legislation. They are not bugs, but features, if done well. Many of the policy rules are now, as we all know, developed uh, by way of algorithms, either decision or decision support. But these algorithms are not developed in a democratic setting. They are decided within the administration. And we can't be sure that they are contestable in a court of law due to all kinds of opacity. Simultaneously, corporations run on software business processes that integrate so-called business rules to ensure legal compliance, but they may not be so sure which interpretation is the right one. Rules code, as I understand it, could perhaps bring transparency traceability, foreseeability, accountability, and reliability to both law making, the output of the legislature, and to public administration, both in terms of individual decisions that the administration yeah. takes, and in terms of the rules it develops uh, in between the legislation and the decisions that they have to make, usually called regulation. Now, the OECD report that writes about rules as code says governments are rule makers. I think that governments are much more than rule makers and actually that they should stop being rule engines. The task of the government is to govern, to take care of the res publica, the public interest. So governments have to decide, they have to act and to develop policies 
regulations on how they will act and how they will decide yeah. in a transparent way. This is yeah. key to the rule of law. It's important both for citizens and for corporations. Moreover, what is key to the rule of law is that governments should act and decide and regulate within the confines of the legality principle which requires that the competences to act, to decide and to regulate are both constituted and limited by the constitution or by way of parliamentary acts. It's important to remember these two things, that uh, these competences are both made by constitution or uh, the law, but also at the same time limited. Now, the legality principle also implies that, for instance, human rights law informs the application of acts of parliaments, even of the constitution, think of international human rights law, but also decisions taken by public administration. <clears throat> so legislators should make law, and that is key to democracy. It is not government that makes the rules of the game, but the democratic legislature. Now, the interesting question here is, if I say legislature should make law, can law be reduced to rules? Are legal norms equivalent with the kind of rules that can be expressed in programming languages? And the answer to the question whether law is a matter of rules is a very long-standing point of attention in the law, in legal theory, and in legal philosophy. To give just two examples yeah. from Anglo-American philosophy, there was Herbert Hart and his seminal work, who basically said, yes, law is about rules. But he also said, part of the rules are yeah. concepts, and concepts have an open texture, and it's not exactly the same as ambiguity. Open texture means that the meaning of words changes depending on how they are used. The use of language is an act and also depending on the circumstances. And Hart was always also very aware of the fact that discretion is key to the law. Next to Hart, who focused on law as rules, we have Dworkin who said no. Law cannot be reduced to rules because law is also about principles and policies that actually define these rules. To understand the rules, you must understand the principles and the policies <clears throat> that, um, that coexist, that inform, that can be inferred from these rules. And Dworkin also paid keen attention to discretion. But other than Hart, he thought that discretion doesn't mean uh, a competence to, dis to decide something based on your personal opinion. Uh, discretion is, means that you have to decide based on the integrity of the law, of the legal system, basically of the entirety of the law. Um, and it's interesting to make this difference between consistency which is about logic and integrity, where logic is important, but it's just part of the game. Now let's take an example. Waddington writes in an excellent research note on rules of code that rules of code is pivotal for the process of drafting legislation. He writes, and I cite, if the coding in RAC merely picks out the if then and or not logic, <clears throat> of exceptions and definitions in a piece of draft legislation. And for instance, points to a scenario yeah. where the first draft legislation would produce an unintended result because the legislator didn't realize that it's writing down contradictions, then it will have done an extremely valuable job. I want to use an example to show the extent to which this may or may not be the case. And as a European yeah. and as working a lot on data protection, I will take an example from the GDPR. So in Article 5.2b, 
this is lawyer's talk, the uh, article about uh, the purpose limitation principle, we read that further processing for scientific research shall be considered as not incompatible with the original purpose. Double negations are the stuff of lawyers, right? So um, imagine is the first purpose of uh, data processing is for instance, medical treatment or uh, online shopping. Article 5.2b seems to say that if that data is repurposed for scientific research, we shall not consider that as incompatible. And as you can imagine, changing, repurposing medical treatment data into scientific research or online shopping into scientific research, which may be done by a commercial company, are quite different things. We also have Article 6.4, which says that further processing for another purpose than that for which data has been collected will be considered compatible based on considering five different criteria. I'm not going to discuss the criteria with you, but the interesting question between 5.2b and 6.4 is whether the presumption of non incompatibility of 5.2b should overrule Article 6.4 that talks about considering all these criteria, or whether these five criteria tests should actually overrule the presumption of 6.4. Now, the European Data Protection Board and the European Data Protection Supervisor believe that the criteria of 6.4 should be taken into account, whereas others yeah. disagree. This seems to be like a contradiction or an ambiguity, and we know that certainty will depend on the Court of Justice of the European Union. And we know that the court can only decide that <clears throat> after a preliminary question is asked. And the answer will, of course, co-depend on the facts of the case. Now, this is a clear example of potential ambiguity, probably not intended. Though we cannot be sure of that. Because legislation, as we know, is often a compromise where things are purposely left in the middle. Actually, I dare say that the GDPR may not have come about if all these kinds of problems had been made explicit by logic solvers at the moment of the drafting of the GDPR. Because we would then have required explicit agreement, which might never happen. Now, would Rules as code solve this problem. Different solutions, of course, can be developed. You can say we need priority of 5.1b or priority of 6.4. <clears throat> the one should overrule the other. And you could also opt for the compromise of the European Data Protection Board. My point here is who, who should be making the decisions? The legislature, policymakers, civil servants, whoever get to make that decision, we might still want the court to have the last word here. Yeah. And the interesting question, one of the key questions today in the round tables and in the town yeah. hall, I hope, is how precisely this point squares with rules as code. How does rules as code affect the rule of law? Where these kind yeah. of decisions are multi-leveled. So the legislature is here, the legislature, the EU legislature, we're talking about the GDPR. The data controllers who have to make a decision because they have to go ahead and either process or not process the data protection supervisors. And the final world will be for the court if they are asked for a decision. So this raises the question of whether every unintended ambiguity is a bad thing or whether it is what keeps our legal system adaptive. What if the ambiguity or contradiction is the result of political compromise? Law in the real world is not just logic. Should we disable such compromises? Should we want to make them explicit? OK, so what is rules of code? Is it a technology? Is it a new technological paradigm? Or is it actually a new way to understand, but also to do law? Where? code has legal effect. 
No, I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to cite uh, Waddington here again, who says that rules of code can involve merely highlighting the logical structures that a drafter is trying to create in the legislation, such that any use of that log logic should always be traceable, explainable, and open to correction or appeal in the same way as it is when a human follows the logic from the text. So here I see that RAC is support for drafting legislation, foreseeing consequences, removing contradiction and unintended ambiguities or unintended discretion. This is about support for government agencies that must apply legislative or regulative rules because they can run the systems to see bugs, conflicts, determine priorities, foresee results, like tax that's going to be paid, benefits that need to be distributed, fines that can be imposed. <clears throat> um, the next speaker, Pia Andrews, shared her uh, definition with us in the previous conversation, where she says it is actually a reliable reference implementation of rules in a machine understandable form to enable the building and testing of systems that rely upon these rules. So that's the third kind of support that RAC could give. The first was for um, the legislator, the second for public administration, and the third is for corporations and citizens that must apply rules that they are subject to, which are often unclear to them, may seem contradictory, whereas RAC would enable them to run this referent implementation against their factual situation to test and foresee what choices they actually have if they want to comply with the law. So that means RAC will serve the building and testing of three kinds of systems that are not necessarily part of RAC. First of all, enforcement on the side of the government noting the government must comply with its own rules. So RAC could and should integrate enforcement that the government does to others, imposes on others, with their own compliance with the rules, because that's the rule of law. Second, it would serve systems of compliance on the side of business and other institutions outside the government, where awareness of an integration of compliance with legislation and reg regulation is often cumbersome, complex, and sometimes not even feasible, notably for uh, SMEs because of the complexities, etc. The idea of RAC, as I understand it, is to provide a reference implementation or an authoritative version of the relevant rules which can be integrated in existing digital business processes across the board, not just in one business, but because there is this one reference system, it could be done everywhere. This should reduce uncertainty, inequality, and increase transparency and trust. And of course, there is the mantra of efficiency. Um, the third one is compliance on the side of individual citizens who are subject to complex legislation and they want to foresee the consequences of choices they have, testing whether they are lawful and running different lawful alternatives against such a reference implementation to foresee the consequences. So I can see the intent ensuring reliable, lawful and democratic drafting understanding and implementation of legal and policy rules to achieve better rules for people, for corporations, etc. Now, how does RAC relate to ROL? I actually titled my keynote, REC and Roll. So on the one hand, you can look at the government as a rule maker. But from the perspective of the rule of law, that's a very shallow way of looking at the law and even at rules. So the idea is that the legislator is a lawmaker and is that in the context of a constitutional democracy. And that means, first of all, representation. Equal respect and concern mean that when people vote for a legislature that is going to make the law, 
um, which consists definitely also of rules that it is one person, one vote, equal respect and concern. Representation. Second is deliberation. We believe that in a democracy, um, parliament sits down to have an agonistic debate to discover public reason. And this is more a matter of argumentation that is adversarial, different opinions than reasoning. Because reasoning, and that is also why reasoning uh, is more on the side of logic and argumentation may be a bit more complex. So we have representation, deliberation, then we have participation. We want those who suffer the consequences of the law to be in a situation to co-decide, not only when voting, but also in other ways. Representation, deliberation, participation, contestation. So under the rule of law in a constitutional democracy, we want the applicability and the validity and the meaning of the law to be contestable. I must be able to contest the law itself because higher law, like human rights law, for instance, uh, would invalidate it. Uh, I can say, well, this legislation doesn't actually apply to me because you are misinterpreting it. So there's contestation. And finally, we have judgment, closure, within the decision phase provided by the law. Now, this is a very much multi-level uh, construction of rules. These are different processes that interact with each other. And I hope it is clear that the role of logic here is limited. And I'm not saying that it has no role, I'm saying it is limited. Um, it is very interesting in that context, and we have no time to go deeply into that, but to remember that between a rule and the facts to who that rule may have to be applied, rules and facts are very different animals. There's a famous philosopher that you must have all heard of, Kant. In his first critique, he describes this fact that Applying a rule to facts requires a jump, a leap, because they're different animals. It requires actually something people call judgment. Um, and that is beyond just logic. So it's not about an arbitrary, subjectivist, emotional or whatever um, jump. It's about a prudent jump. It's about uh, practical wisdom, etc. Uh, so we should remember that this leap uh, should be made by a human person, which not at all means that that human person is always going to make the right decision. That depends on many different things. Okay, so now what are legal norms? There are rules maybe, there are principles, policies. The key thing about legal norms is that they have legal effect and that that legal effect is attributed by positive law. Last year we held a seminar uh, with a number of key people, some of whom are here. It was a very interesting seminar, very happy with uh, the, uh, the input and discussions in the papers, papers that are going to be published in the Journal of Cross-Disciplinary Research into Computational Law. And the question of that seminar was whether and on what basis computer code could have intended legal effect of binding a constituency as if it were legislation. This is key to today's global plenary and key to the roundtables and to the town hall. That's related to the question, what does the word authoritative mean in the OECD report and what does the word reference implementation mean? Yeah. Does it refer to those um, translation or uh, declarative uh, coding yeah. of legislation into computer code uh, would have itself legal effect? And if it doesn't have legal effect itself, wouldn't the fact that 
um, it's going to be used as a reference implementation have indirect legal effect. Rule of law means that it is not the government that decides the meaning of the law, but an independent court in the context of an interplay between legislature, administration, citizens, private parties, and the courts who have the final word, but we all know that after that, the legislator can change the law again. Now I'm going to end with three questions um, uh, that, that should inform whether we want computer code to have legal effect. And very briefly, these questions are what problems would rules of code actually solve? What problems would they not solve? And what problems could they create? So what problems would RAC actually solve? Maybe uncertainty, maybe conflicting interpretation, contestability, because if you remove yeah. uncertainty and if you remove conflicting interpretation, why should people contest things? And we all know that our courts are overloaded, so I'm not saying that everybody contesting everything is by definition a good thing. I don't think that's what the rule of law is about. You can use logic solvers for that, declarative programming. Now, what problems can rules as code not solve? That's democracy and the rule of law yeah. that together in our societies constitute the rules that rules as code talk about. And democracy yeah. and the rule of law are not problems to be solved, but problems to be sustained. Logic yeah. solvers assume a closed world and a closed world is incompatible with law. That doesn't mean they cannot play a role, but we must remember which types of problems cannot be solved. And the final question, what problems could rules as code create? If regulators, um, public administration decide, we may have less contestability because if we solve the issue of interpretation, you might end up in a closed world. I'm very well aware that the purpose and the objective of rules as code is not to remove all ambiguity or discretion or contestability, but it should be clear that part of that is going to be pushed upstream to the moment the legislator is drafting. And we should be very aware of what sort of problems that could create. So I'm looking forward very much to, um, to the discussion and um, both in the round tables and in the town hall. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me and uh, looking forward to the next speaker also. Thank you, Mireille. We are indeed honored to have you with us today. A long time friend of the society delivering our keynote. These are complex issues on which you have written volumes in your scholarly work. Thank you for your key questions. What, are, what problems will RAC solve? What problems can RAC not solve? And what problems could RAC create? We have, I think, time for a quick question, and I apologize, this is without notice. If you were writing the rule book for Rules as Code, what would be the most important factor to get right to ensure that rules as code is not, as you say, as you say, not a closed world. A couple of sentences would be great. Thank you, Marie. Um, yes, well, there are very many ways to apply, but there is one thing I think that is key. Yeah. So if the legislator removes certain types of intended or unintended um, ambiguities and um, public administration or at a later point, a court, decides to overrule that and say that was wrong, then it is very important to know what the consequences are. And that might be, for instance, that um, the legislator adapts the code, the reference implementation or whatever. And then we have to ask the question, what does that mean for all the decisions that have been taken on the previous code? So you could say that we should introduce some sort of prospective overruling. That means that the court says, well, from now on, it should be interpreted like this. Or 
but all decisions before that remain in place. Or the court could say, well, actually, when I read that law, so the natural language, in the context of other laws, constitution, yeah. human rights law, etc., uh, it could not have been interpreted this way. So I'm not going to do <coughs> perspective overruling. All previous decisions based on this are now overruled. And as you can understand, that would create perhaps more problems than RAC solves. And I think this is really a key issue that we have to look into. And it's just one of many, so. Thank you, Mireille. Now to our opening address. Pia Andrews joins us from Broome, Western Australia. Pia is known to many of you. She has led strategic RAC and digital transformation projects across multiple jurisdictions, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Pia has been recognized as one of the global top 20 most influential in digital government and was awarded as one of the top 100 most influential women in Australia. Pia Andrews will discuss the challenges in the digital world to ensure that decisions and actions taken by governments are traceable to the legislative and regulatory rules that govern them. For bios on all of our speakers, um, please see our official plenary program. It's in the chat. Now over to you, Pia. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for having me. And I do want to acknowledge um, the um, you uh, Yaru people uh, on whose land I come to you from and uh, the uh, huge amount that we continue to learn from them every day. Um, I actually have a, a whole deck, but I'm not going to use a whole deck. I'm going to take a, a leaf from Mario's um, book. Uh, and I'm only going to use a couple of the slides. Uh, so I'm going to actually start by just um, saying I've come to a lot of the same positions, um, but from a very different uh, starting point. My rough definition of RSE, which I know will be different from several of yours, but my definition is a purposefully machine consumable representation of ideally prescriptive legislation and regulation delineated, and this is the important part, delineated from systems, from logic, business logic, from operational policy, from decisions and actions explicitly so that we can do three things. So that we can use the rules more consistently and efficiently, because at the moment we have lots of rules in code all over the place in, business, in myriad business systems and myriad, myriad you know, software. Um, and um, very rarely is it actually assurable or testable uh, back to law but I'll come back to that. Secondly, so that we can actually enable the testing and assurance of the legal legitimacy of decisions and actions that are based on those rules. And finally, so that we can, as um, uh, Matthew's been quoted um, substantially and uh, I completely agree and um, have done a lot of work in, so that we can actually improve the drafting process, uh, the quality of policy in the first place and reduce the unintended consequences of a um, highly complex and increasingly um, complex um, rules environment and uh, that, that we all play in, uh, not just domestically but locally. I think this is extremely important now more than ever because uh, veracity and trust is really the big problem that we all need to solve. People don't know, um, you know, when we're just browsing online, you know, what's true, what's not true whether something's genuine, um, uh, it is very difficult to um, understand uh, the outcome of a lot of government decisions. It's very, uh, we are all continually getting this uh, computer gets no um, perspective and uh, the increasing use of various forms of artificial intelligence is uh, seeing that just becoming um, worse and worse. Uh, we're getting more black box decision making and, and technologies and it is getting harder to uh, audits to appeal, uh, let alone to um, identify as legit uh, decisions. So, um, so just to be very clear, for me, rules as code, um, RAC is just one pillar for trustworthy government, just one. There are many, many things that need to be done to achieve trustworthy governance and trustworthy public sectors. Um, for my money, I think that rules as code is a necessary precondition for trustworthy systems and technologies. Uh, but we also need, of course, to shift from pure economic measures to human measures so that we're you know, not just being perversely incentivized to prioritize money over people. We need to shift to more participatory democracy and actually invite citizens into the process of the development 
it, of policies, of services, of rules. Uh, obviously, we need not just robust records keeping, which governments has always um, strived to have, but those records need to capture in real time. This decision was made based on these rules, based on this data affecting this person in this way, so that then 10 years down the track, you don't have someone saying, oh, we gave you money 10 years ago and the onus is on you to prove why, otherwise you have to pay it back. Those kinds of putting the onus on the citizen to say why government has made a decision is um, uh, deeply inequitable and um, and uh, an absolute uh, abuse of the power, um, uh, you know, um, differential between uh, government and citizens. And of course, shifting to shared governance. Um, the other starting premise for RAC for me is that administrative law is no less relevant in a digital context. And yet a lot of our systems now having been shifted over the last 30 years from paper processes and manual human processes into technology, um, quite often what we're seeing is, um, uh, you know, someone responsible for determining the business requirements, handing that over to IT, who then is told to blindly implement uh, what's been given to them by somebody else. And, um, and we're actually, we've lost that traceability to, to the end point. Um, so the problems facing us today, and, the, and part of the reason I got um, into this five or six years ago, is because, um, first of all, we have completely a complete inconsistency of even prescriptive rules. Um, if you look at any uh, business system, any application, any software in government, um, there is usually going to be a combination of rules. There's going to be legislation that the department needs to maintain. Um, I was I first got into this because of looking at regulation, um, particularly anti-money laundering, counterterrorism funding, uh, regulation for the financial sector. And even if we just took the prescriptive rules um, that um, are in that particular regulatory regime and made it available as a reference implementation that the financial sector could consume and test against, we had banks telling us it would save them $16 million a year each. <laughs> um, so it, this inconsistency of rules, the cost of implementing, we are effectively using, and I always joke about this, and some of you have heard this many times, but um, we're effectively using lawyers as modems to constantly and continuously translate between analog and digital. And it's a very slow and very expensive and very inconsistent approach because every interpretation might be slightly different. And then once you jump through the interpretation, the um, right through to the implementation, there, there are many breakpoints where you could get a, a difference of, um, of meaning. Um, Clearly, rules are slow to create, they're slow to measure, they're slow to change. Uh, they're, they're, sorry, it's um, they might be fast to change, but the implementation of change is very slow because you've got to know a change has happened, interpret it, uh, codify it, and then put it into your own business system. So RAC gives us the possibility of uh, addressing that. It gives us the possibility of being able to map at least some of the complexity of the environment and um, reduce the unpredictability of change. Um, by actually being able to test change in a, in a broader environment and broader system. And it actually starts to close the gap between this enormous chasm that has grown between policy and implementation. Um, and I've been at so many events where, um, you know, someone will say, well, our policy was perfect. It, it was in the implementation that there was a problem. And it sort of misses the point that if you have implementation and policy together, you have the chance of, you know what, even if there is a genuine problem here, you can actually close the loop and fix it together. Um, but this throwing stuff over the um, over the wall is is clearly part of the challenge. Um, we have decreasing visibility of the traceability back to law, back to regulation and legislation in particular, um, and that then creates enormous issues for auditing and for appeals. How do you how do you audit the legal legitimacy of a decision? How do you appeal a decision if you're just getting the outcome of the decision and you don't know on what basis it was? many departments I've worked in, um, if they get a, um, an appeal, they, they can't question the um, decision in the actual business system, in the actual software system that produced the initial outcome. They actually have a human team that go and do the interpretation and then provide a different thing, but then don't um, sometimes a conflicting result than what came out of the software, but often enough don't even have a mechanism to feed those um, changes of interpretation back into the software system. So this complete lack of um, software traceability, software veracity uh, and software accountability back to law is, is a, a real problem. So, um, and, and the final part for me, and this is gonna be a bit new for some of you, I think, 
is um, that a lot of our rules and systems and approaches, a lot of our teams in government are completely unprepared for the concept of machines as users. The same um, levers and incentives and punishments, um, the same levers that we can use to, if you like, nudge human behaviour, whether it's in regulation or whether it's in uh, controlling how we actually do uh, public administration and legislation, um, the same things that work for humans don't necessarily work for machines. A machine is not going to be um, incentivized by punishment or reward or um, jail time or a fine. And so we actually need to test some of our rules with um, machines so that we can actually be better prepared for, better monitoring for, and better responsive to um, the, um, uh, the already happening but dramatically increasing uh, machines as users of our rules and make sure that we're not creating perverse incentive or, or um, perverse outcomes when um, it's not just a human interpreting or using the rule. So I guess where this is coming from is it's not about shifting the intent and purpose of law. It's actually about uh, all legislation and regulation. It's about actually just introducing some 19th century, sorry, some 21st century approaches to make it fit the purpose in the digital age and more effective in the digital age. So ideally, um, RAC is about creating uh, a machine consumable form um, in all of the, the research that's happened around the world and particularly the fantastic paper from New Zealand from Tom um, Barakloff and Hamish Fraser and, and a couple of others. Um, the, the concept that um, machine consumable form of um, legislation and regulation would always be a at best reliable reference implementation, I think totally makes sense, like keep the human form the authoritative version. But, um, but if you don't have a reliable reference implementation publicly available, then um, you, you have nothing to test against. So ideally being able to get that publicly available would be, um, would be best. At the same time, communities creating their own interpretation is um, completely legit as well. And in fact, if there does end up being a, a different interpretation from a community or a company, then that provides the opportunity to fix, get clarity and get consistency. Whereas at the moment, those different interpretations happen everywhere, but you just have no visibility or, or um, oversight of it. So I just wanna show a couple of um, slides just to hopefully help illustrate that. Um, oh, no, it may not work. Uh, actually, I can't show slides anyway, because uh, there's an issue with my uh, computer, sorry. But I've got um, in the deck that I just shared um, on slide six, that the current state is that we do have rules in code. Uh, anyone that says um, codifying rules is going to create a problem is missing the point that the rules are already codified across the entire system right now. Um, everyone that has to apply rules, which is most businesses, every department, um, uh, you know, even a lot of um, a, a lot of nonprofits, anyone that has to use government rules or wants to use government rules has to find them, the human readable form, does an interpretation. And in the case of legislation, uh, of which the primary consumer of legislation is government itself, um, the actual legislation gets um, mashed up like, uh, like a spaghetti sauce with um, operational policy. And the problem is that when you take legislation and operational policy and just smush them together, um, the operational policies can sometimes, and I have seen this many times, actually cancel out the law. So you end up with, um, with rules that are um, in legislation that are actually part of the formal law being unintentionally overridden by um, a, a, a different rule or a different set or a different um, or, or some black box decision making from an actual uh, from the actual software, such as the legislation might say calculated monthly and the software is hard coded to calculate quarterly. And so then they just divide by three. And of course, that ends up with a, a problem. So, um, so and, and what does a month mean anyway? Does it mean, um, yeah, you know, um, does it mean this many days or does it mean this many weeks or does it mean this percentage of a year? You know, everyone interprets that differently, which is how we get uh, different outcomes. So then you get myriad um, um, once you've got that interpretation, mirrored interpretations, you get mirrored implementations, and then you get the inability to um, uh, to monitor and to assure. And generally speaking, government is pretty terrible these days at providing assurance that you've got the rules right. Um, our approach over recent years has been shifting to just telling people when they get it wrong. <laughs> so it's um, very important to get back to the point of saying, you know what, there is no one else is going to assure 
uh, your rules because government is the only entity um, um, legitimately responsible for, constitutionally responsible for legislation and regulation. So we need to get into the business of being able to provide assured rules that people can rely upon rather than just sitting back and saying, you go figure it out. Um, and the other part of this, of course, is that with the enormous, again, um, mechanisation of, of our systems and economies, uh, with machines using these rules over and over and over again, if you actually had a reference implementation of, of rules as code, of legislation regulation as code, that people can consume or test against, you can then start looking for anti-patterns. You know, here's a pattern that we expect. Here's an anti-pattern emerging. Is that a new problem or is that a new norm or is that something to respond to or does that create a trigger for um, uh, for regulatory reform? So it, it, this creates new opportunities for monitoring, for auditing, for appealing. So the future state is getting into obviously all the rules that we already have. We have to you know, be able to make, um, well, not all of them necessarily, but certainly ones that are heavily used and largely prescriptive, trying to make them available would be helpful as um, rules as code, but getting actually drawing a line in the sand at some point and saying new rules and regulations um, should um, get into this co-drafting approach so that you can actually use rules as code. Um, we also call it the better rules methodology to actually develop reform or new rules from the start so that you can actually take a test driven approach. So you can actually, rather than just releasing a draft human form that people need to interpret um, and give feedback on, but the actual implementation might end up being completely different. Having human and machine consumable form of the rules gives you a chance, isomorphically drafted and tested against each other, of course, gives you a chance to then test the reality of the implementation and effect and impact of uh, your changes to rules or your new rules or your reduced rules. Um, and it gives you a whole bunch of opportunities around tests. So it's not just about having the rules available as code, it's also about having test suites. Um, a person or a company or a transaction with these characteristics should either um, invoke this outcome or they are or aren't eligible or should pay this or this much. You know, these prescriptive type of rules are actually very helpful to be able to um, then test against, uh, which is uh, fairly important moving forward. So in the deck, you'll see that um, this idea of starting from a logic model that you can do um, together, where you can actually getting into the idea that policy should be multidisciplinary drafted, I think is really key. You shouldn't just have the policy people over there, the data people over here, the operational policy people over here, the tech people over here, the design people over here, actually getting people together with the users and consumers of rules to actually co-draft uh, enables a more adaptive, agile, test-driven and um, many voices in the room approach uh, to make sure that the rules are actually um, going to be effective, understood and implemented in the intended way. Um, there are many examples of, of RAC um, emerging. Um, the French government and the fantastic team uh, over there with, with Matty and with Malco and with more um, really kind of led the way on this. Uh, they started from just trying to build uh, integrated services, the ability to say, anonymously, I just want to provide some information and find out what I'm eligible for. Then from that, they sort of went, well, let's just have the legislation as code and then let's be able to mash those things up so that we can get different eligibility and calculation criteria to just be able to help people understand what they're eligible for. Um, that starting premise was very, like I started from a regulatory premise and then came to that premise. But um, it's so obvious when you think about it that um, you only really have three ways to implement that sort of service um, integration, that sort of unified approach to service delivery and government. It's only really three ways. You either hard code it all yourself, at which point the onus and potential for mistake and inconsistencies is overwhelming. You could go to all the departments and say, well, you already have rules engines. Could we draw from that? But of course, the problem is that every one of those rules engines has a combination of legislation and operational policy in them. So it may or may not be correct. It may or may not be legit. And, um, and it's certainly not transparent and trying to create a translation layer is hard. And then so it became a fairly logical uh, next step to say, well, why wouldn't we have the legislation available, prescriptive rules as code that we could then draw from for government systems, for any sort of system. So it, um, it was a uh, just a natural sort of consequence. So I'll just talk through a couple of the last couple of concepts. So I've explained what I think RAC is to me. I'm going to tell you what it is not to me. RAC is not automated law or decisions. Um, I think they have their own category, automated law, <laughs> automated decision making, um, robotic, robotic process automation. Um, 
RAC for me is just the pure rules as code that could be drawn on for business systems, for automation systems, for um, service delivery, for um, auditing and assurance, for all kinds of different use cases. But just the pure rules as code with no cleverness or smartness or anything particularly, you know, um, intense in it is an enabler for all kinds of other things. But the moment you load it up, uh, you'll end up with the um, the SharePoint of rules engines. You'll end up with something that tries to be everything to everyone and ends up being useless to everyone. It is not structured content. XML is only about making it easier to take content and create structure around it for the purpose of representation. It does not help a machine understand it. It is about creating a machine consumable form, not a human consumable form. It is not, Rack is not an interpretation engine. It's not a tool that says, pump in your, your human legislation and I will either on the fly or, or once off do an interpretation and create a code version. Because these sort of tools, which are prevalent and are everywhere at the moment, um, they're helpful for conversion in the first instance, but quite often they end up being black boxes, input equals output, and you don't see the decision making or the traceability back. Um, and um, and they're sort of getting away from, well, if you every time you do an interpretation, whether it's a machine doing the interpretation or a human doing the interpretation, you've got the possibility of inconsistent application. So um, having just the rules as code that you can actually directly use is um, far preferable to my mind than an interpretation engine. It's definitely not an AI solution and it's definitely not just a website. These are the things that are not rack for me and hopefully that um, is helpful. Um, I've spoken about what sort of rules. Uh, I think um, we've spoken about print principles a fair bit in, um, in, the, in the comments here. So just to be really clear, um, it is not meant to codify principles-based rules. There are some possibilities once exemptions or exceptions emerge over time, once precedent is set over time, that you may codify the edge cases, which can actually help um, with certain things, but that's not, of course, um, legislation or regulation. You're now starting to codify exemptions or um, exceptions. But um, it, it is worth just briefly mentioning the, um, the fact that we've had 30 years or 20 or 30 years of a lot of governments buying into the myth that principles are better than prescription. And I just want to quickly address this because um, as a implementation person who also is qualified and, and working on policy often, um, uh, it's not about principle or prescriptive based regulation and legislation. It's about recognizing that they both have a place. Where you want to have judgment, keep principles based, but it has to be somewhere where you legitimately want judgment and you are happy to have inconsistency of implementation. If you want consistency of implementation, you have to make it prescriptive. If you said once a person comes of age, you know, a lot of people are going to possibly interpret that differently unless you've defined it very clearly. But if you say once a person turns 18, you still got the issue of the 24 hour cycle and which point on that day to, to do it. But um, but having a very clear, um, you know, a person of this age is eligible for blah is far better than if the person is mature enough. Uh, because this creates, um, in that particular case, principles based can actually create great inconsistency and inequity. So being very clear that if you want to have consistent implementation and application, principles, uh, sorry, um, prescriptive rules are really great. If you want to maintain judgment, and there are many where, many areas where we should, prescript, uh, principles based is really good. But please don't just do one or the other, and please don't um, presume principles are principles based regulation legislation is simply better. Um, it is uh, it has created enormous issues and a lot of lockout, particularly for smaller players that don't have the resources to continuously pay a lawyer to do interpretation. Um, and I think I've spoken a little bit about the benefits. There's a bunch of use cases around the world. And um, I just want to finish on a couple of um, points around um, AI and augmented workforces. We're shifting, hopefully, away from just pure automation agendas, which are happening everywhere and are deeply frustrating and, and perpetuating status quo and, and, you know, amplifying inequity in a lot of cases, but shifting to an augmented approach where we can use machines for what they do best, which is dealing with quantity, uh, with pattern recognition, with um, navigating complexity, um, uh, with helping with that, you know, traceability and repeatability, uh, but maintaining humans at the right point, um, you know, in the whole process for the accountability, empathy, uh, solution design, uh, maintaining discretion and intent. Um, the, the Having a very humane and human workforce that is augmented by machines is so important so that we don't, as many people have started to do, just shift to trying to 
automate or replace the human workforce with machines, which would be and is a very dangerous path. So there's a lot to explore in this space, a lot. It's still very emerging in some respects, but um, a, a critical thing for us to progress. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of experimentation, a lot of research over the last five or six years, and it really is, I believe, critical to shift into the implementation, um, at least for certain areas, because otherwise what we're seeing already is every AI um, project is simply either using um, uh, machine learning to do on-the-fly interpretation of rules and application of rules, and that's um, creating that inconsistency across, perpetuating the inconsistency across every business system. Um, and we are missing the opportunity to create traceable, trustworthy, and um, equitable uh, application of um, legislation and regulation across our systems. So there's a lot of area to explore. Um, the looking at the cultural impact, looking at the um, ethical um, impact, looking at the change to behaviours needed um, and um, and required. Um, I'm going to take a, another leaf from um, Maria's book and just give you some key answers that I think need to be answered for for us to have trustworthy systems, particularly trustworthy government systems or trustworthy regulated systems. Number one, how do you audit the process and decision in real time? Not just, you know, once a year or whenever, you know, they, they float to the top of the prioritisation um, process. Um, or the risk um, um, analysis process, but how do you actually audit 100% all the time in real time? And if you can't, then you have a problem because if you can't audit in real time, then you can't find patterns and you can't respond to patterns. Number two, how would a citizen appeal a decision? They need to know about the decision. They need to have a record of the decision. They need to have traceability within the decision of this decision was made based on this actual law, on this actual piece of legislation or regulation at this point in time with this data. If you don't have that record keeping and that access to that record and then the ease of appealing that decision, you, then you have a deeply inequitable and, um, um, you know, unjust system. Number three, what are your checks, balances and oversights? Every department that self-governs and self-assesses um, and then doesn't have not just independent oversight from other departments, but more importantly, independent oversight from outside of government, is um, creating downward spirals of, of convenience. You know, um, we're going to do exactly as much um, governance as convenient. And I have seen some horror stories over the last 10 years in that respect. Four, and there's only two more. How would you know? How would you know whether something is having a negative impact on people, a negative effect? If you don't measure for harm, then you can't do no harm. That means measuring human quality of life um, um, measures, not just economic measures. It means monitoring for change beyond just the KPIs you're trying to deliver. It means um, understanding and intentionally seeking broad impact and understanding so that you can ensure that your systems are trustworthy and that they do no harm. And finally, my final question, which is a very human question and, um, and one that is absolutely not codifiable, what does the public need for you to be considered trustworthy? This answer will be different for different departments, for different contexts, for different jurisdictions. But if you don't actually ask people what it would take for you to trust my systems, my decisions, my services, my policies, then we're going to continue down this rabbit hole that we're in right now where public trust and confidence in government is um, declining, um, leading to huge impact on public policy, on, on health policy, on all kinds of stuff. Um, but, um, but government departments continue to just try to seek social license. Well, let's just see what people are happy for us to do and then let's do that and then just try to push people more and more and more. We don't need to share data to get data insights. You don't need to um, sacrifice privacy to get a better service. You can have a deeply and amazingly personal, private and um, protected experience, even an anonymous experience, that is also a high quality service. There are so many ways to do that today, but the um, the 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 perceived dichotomy of better privacy or better services, but you can't have both is actually part of the problem that we need to get over. So talking to the public about what it would take to be trustworthy, um, you know, it, it is a key part of creating a more trustworthy um, uh, public service and public system and, and RAC is a part of that. So the very final note I'll say is a lot of people hear some of this and um, and say, oh, it's too big, it's too different, it's, it's um, you know, uh, but, but that's such a leap from where we are. I just want to remind you all, we invented all of this. 
So we can reinvent it. And if we don't, who will? There's, there's this, rather than taking a normative, here's the status quo and how do we just iterate it, we do need at certain points to think transformatively, to think about what's the ideal future state and how do we walk towards it rather than just edging our way and iterating our way away from the status quo that, that isn't particularly working. So I'll leave it there. So um, thank you all so much for your time and I hope that was helpful for today's discussion. I'm looking forward to diving into the uh, working group. Thank you, Pia, for bringing Rules as Code to life and sharing a vision for Rules as Code 2.0. Lyria, I will hand over to you to moderate our roundtable sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, that I'm dialing in from the UNSW Kensington campus, which is the unceded territory of the Bedigal people, and acknowledge their elders um, past and present. Also draw everybody's attention to the importance of Indigenous people having a voice over the content of rules, however they are implemented, um, that of course over the implementation as well. Um, so um, what we are doing now is we are moving to the roundtables. Now the purpose of the roundtables is to share ideas, collaborate, explore, network and of course have fun. After the roundtables we'll come back to this plenary meeting. So that's everybody together here um, for sort of five minute maximum um, debriefs from each of the roundtables. There'll also be um, written outputs from each roundtable in the form of a roundtable canvas. The note taker in each roundtable is going to prepare that canvas together with the facilitators based on the conversations that take place um, during the roundtable. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through all six roundtables. That's the five official roundtables and the, I'm going to call it the hallway roundtable, um, the roundtable um, that, that happened when you couldn't get into a roundtable for technical reasons. Um, so five minutes each, please, um, maximum, um, and we'll start with round table one. So in uh, round table one, we had a very, uh, very lively discussion um, around the practical realities of making RAC projects happen in different contexts. Um, so in terms of what we, what we came to, the first one is there is no single definition for RAC, uh, and maybe that's okay. Um, what is critical is that the definition that we use remain flexible enough to be usable in different circumstances with different user groups for different use cases. Um, it's, it's okay not to have a single definition because RAC in many ways is a general purpose technology and it can be applied to radically different use cases along a fairly broad spectrum. Um, much like AI is currently being applied, much like the combustion engine was being applied. Um, the second point uh, was around um, effective methodology for getting by. Um, sorry, that might be better. Um, effective methodology for getting by in. Uh, the, the people in our group discussed how they've had success in showing rather than telling, providing, working out loud, providing live demos and demonstrating the uh, utility and simplicity of a rack enabled solution. Um, and that's what made people's eyes light up. That's what made them realize the potential there. Yeah, it's tangible um, rather than theoretical discussions. Exactly. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, you have to you have to show them how it's going to work. Uh, and then thirdly, the, the, the final point we got to was there's there's a missing piece in getting buy in and progressing uh, rack in its maturity. And that's a, a fully realized business case um, because it's not enough to show the potential of the solution. You've got to show the, the potential of it in economic terms. It may seem crude, but uh, that is what gets a lot of senior decision makers going in both government contexts and private sector contexts. How much money will this save us? How much in the way of benefit will this bring to the community? Will this bring to our user groups? And right now we don't have that. And so perhaps that's something we as a community can work on getting. Perhaps we can develop uh, a business case, develop some economic modeling that shows the potential of the, um, the approach, the methodology, so we can convince different users to actually start investing in developing solutions. 
it was it was quite um, explicit that the difference between capex and opex that a lot of the 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 private enterprises are willing to burn their their opex but they're not willing to, to to put their hand in their pocket for capex to put the investment into rules as code and how do we break down those barriers and again we came back to multidisciplinary and we came back to actually instead of us just waiting we should actually just bring it to them and get our multidisciplinary teams together and bring it to the table going this is how you do it and, and start answering those questions instead of you know theoretically talking about them and, and and bringing it to the next level and get that get that blank check on front of as many people with rules as code as mm. possible but yeah if we could show some actual economic modeling of the benefits that i think that would be very powerful right now we're relying on very narrow uh, analyses from several years ago and i think we need something a little more modern so if anyone has a tame economist uh please let us know that's it from roundtable one it was very fun um looking forward to hearing everybody else's findings thanks tim and thanks siobhan and good to know we need to add economists now to our multidisciplinary teams um that's that's fantastic um and we've got the very helpful list here from natalia so roundtable two professor guido governatori so, well, uh, the first finding from our round table is that, well, rule as code, it's a mythical entity that cannot be described, but you are going to recognize when you experience it. And uh, well, so we didn't want to give uh, a single definition, and I think it's not uh, helpful to give a single definition. And at this moment, rule as code, it's just an umbrella for uh, a variety of activities. The underlying theme is that at the end, we want to represent in a computer format uh, law and regulations uh, and other legislative instruments. And this is the one of the challenge because uh, there are many, many different approaches. And also we recognize uh, that uh, having many different approaches, uh, it's not necessarily negative because we can experiment. We can learn from them and we can understand what works and what doesn't work. But we have to look carefully. We have to take insight for what has been done in legal theory over the past 2.5 millennia. So we are not writing laws anymore on, on stone. We move to paper, we move to the web. And so we have to look for the next version. And But this will pose a challenge because how can we ensure the persistency, the usability of what we have created and the, the, the new format? So one of the ideas is to use the use of standards, but there are many, many different ways to use standards to foster interoperability. And the key here for Rulas Code is to foster interoperability, to have systems to speak with each other. And then uh, a key intuition we have uh, discussed is that, well, we need a different standard for different purposes, standard to communicate, standard to represent the legislation to represent the law, the regulation, standard to how to interface with other systems, and so on. And also we have to see how to maintain them over time. But then we went down at the end, what are some of the, of the technical challenges? First of all, to determine what are the standards, what are the actual systems, and essentially what are the key aspects to make this successful. And some of the aspects, uh, I would say the key aspect, it's uh, we have to build trust in computers. And in our round table, well, we didn't have trust since uh, it kicked out uh, a few times. So how can we build trust? <laughs> but yeah. And here, the key point for trust was, uh, well, we have to have transparent, uh, understandable representations, and then they should be explicable. And essentially, we have to identify what are the key points to enable uh, explicability. And essentially, we can represent what are the decisions and how to reach decisions. And we didn't focus on other aspects. And one of the other uh, key points is scalability. And there are two levels of scalability. So one of the example is, uh, well, uh, from OSLI, they have uh, one over one million uh, different sections of law. How can we represent them properly? But also from a computer computational point of view, we have to be able to model and execute at the same time a very large uh, piece of 
encoding, so not just that one or two rows. So those are the key findings, and it was uh, an interesting and fun experience, and I'd like to thank all the participants in the roundtable for their contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, really encourage sort of the conversation um, around the presentations in the chat. So um, everyone, keep going with that. Um, it's it's probably the best way to do it in the time we have available, and we'll make sure we capture all of those um, comments and remarks. But for the big questions on democracy, over on roundtable three to Professor Louis de Quirker. So much, uh, Lyria and uh, all of the organisers. We had a great session. It was an interesting one. It was um, also complicated by the fact that a number of our thought leaders were caught behind the firewall. Um, but uh, we had great discussions last week. So what I want to share with you, if you can sh share my screen as the canvas we, uh, we, we worked on in the background, um, where are we now? We fully agree, looking at it from our perspective, this focus on democracy and navigating ethics, societal change, in, uh, impact and change. Um, we agree there's, there's a good level of excitement about rules of as code and with the others that there's a lack of clarity about terminology. That is problematic for the things that interests us in this roundtable discussion. Uh, we got a number of government projects, but somewhat black box. There's not necessarily a lot of information available to enable us to really engage and unpack those projects. And then, of course, all of the, the, the noise around agreement and disagreement uh, around rules as code that probably sheets back to different definitions and could be clarified if we had a, great, a, a better conceptual framework and a better ontology. Um, we uh, we, we discussed ethics as part of our roundtable and thought that going forward, it would be important to, to formulate and agree on ethical principles for rules as code projects. Um, what leads their selection? Um, what informs how they operate and what informs the assessment. What does success looks like? And that now that 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 touches on 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 the economic discussion of roundtable one. Uh, what are we going to factor into our success factors, and how are we going to establish that they've been achieved? How do we ensure holistic, transparent, ongoing assessment of rules as code projects once implemented? Do we need risk identification early on? that can then be uh, expanded. We, 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 we need flexible frameworks. We need to use the current period to prepare for the future. And looking forward into the future, automated non-human interpretation and coding of law at scale. Um, and the idea to uh, develop rules as code as a service or start thinking about it in that way so that we use our pilots to start co contributing to that future. A couple of guiding principles around trust, just mentioned by Roundtable 2, transparency of the project's ethical uh, principles, both in development and implementation, evidence-based holistic and transparent assessment. Um, we would have discussed um, embracing explainable legal AI principles in this process that arose from our pre-discussions. And we also had a discussion about reliance on open, way soft, uh, open source software, which on the one side sounds good and important, but on the other hand, uh, we also discussed some of the limitations relating to that, especially relating to quality, where what is not open source may actually be higher quality. Is, do we want to focus on the source of the data or on the quality and transparency? of the software and around uh, opportunities for the future. I think there's a number stemming from going forward, um, but uh, we, uh, we we also thought working on a code of ethics or rules as code, code of ethics would be helpful and settling this open source debate would also be helpful. Now, thank you to a great round table set of people who contributed, whether they were in the round table eventually or not. Our, our note taker and presenter was also caught outside the firewall and that's why you're listening to me. So thank you to everyone for your flexibility.
Thank you, Little Rio. Thank you very much, Louis. Sounds like it was a fabulous discussion in, in multiple phases um, and really appreciate that. Um, so we've got a long chat now, so I've got to go all the way back up to find um, who is doing roundtable for. Luke, is it you? Um, yes, that's right. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. No, it's good. You appeared miraculously and saved me the trouble. Um, I appreciate yeah. that. Over to you. Brilliant. Well, uh, again, can I thank all the organisers um, and to everyone participating in the workshop, which was great fun. Um, so just a quick canter through some of the things that we discussed. The first was the relationship between the coded version and the natural language version. Um, I think we started off with Pierre's summary of perhaps the, the natural language version being uh, in charge, um, but a, a provocation was made that don't, you know, should that be so? Don't assume that people can read uh, uh, natural language laws, so why should it prevail over code? Um, an issue was made that having two versions with equal force could be problematic, although on the other hand it was said, well, that can work um, for bilingual uh, bilingual legislation where one, uh, one's, one, one version can inform the interpretation of the other, so this could actually improve. Um, a point made was that Parliament can decide what of any force to give to the coded version, and even if it's um, even if the code version isn't the law, the code can be used to inform the interpretation of the natural language version, just like explanatory notes and other material does. Um, secondly, we moved on to what aspects should be digitised and why. Again, we thought Pierre had summarised it quite well, or well as a good starting point. Those uh, bits of legislation which are heavily used and are largely prescriptive are perhaps a good a good place to start for things that would be useful. Um, the point was made that. Um, some legislation is very political, um, where the law is made due, negoti due negotiations or where it's negotiated law, it may be that it's less uh, capable of being uh, reduced to, to logic. Um, moving on to the kinds of problems that rules of code aims to address um, and where there need, there need to be changes to legislative drafting habits. Um, a point was made that perhaps there need to be a change to the uh, drafting skill sets. So putting myself out of a job, for example, um, because we need people who could uh, turn policy into code rather than turning it into law. But that, that, that's fine. I can I can retire now. Um, uh, a point was also made that I think that, uh, and this is more more in the nature of, um, would would this kind of process change the kinds of laws that we would make? Would, would we have, for example, more prescriptive laws which had less discretion? Was that you know a potential harm or or a down point? Um, we then moved on to questions about jurisdiction and the, uh, were there differences between different jurisdictions. Um, we thought at least in, in the um, uh, uh, Westminster kinds of systems, Parliament could work out um, and make sure that people could be treated fairly. Um, but we did also note that there, in, 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 in a lot of places there were different constitutional layers, for example, EU law and UK law could interact with each other and that could in affect interpretation. Uh, finally, we ended with mechanisms to enhance legal accuracy and uh, testing and using test cases were, uh, were raised as examples. And a great quote uh, was made, which is all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So um, the point there was we need to understand what the limits of the model are. In other words, when, when it is safe to use a model and when it isn't. Um, uh, an example was made of, for example, we could have uh, flow charts or decision trees and to uh, check the coded version and the natural language versions against against the flow chart or, dis or the decision tree. And in fact, more people could probably interact with that version than, than the other two versions. So we could end up with a system with with if we if we had a published flow chart or decision tree, then that could be the the the, the thing which everyone actually interacted with most and understood most. Um, finally, what did we think? Well, current applications potentially lack some flexibility. Can we, are, are they easy to change when uh, court decisions are made or uh, new rules are made? Can the model be updated easily? Um, we also thought traceability and accountability and transparency are essential. We are very much uh, against black boxes and in favour of uh, transparency and contestability. Finally, uh, on a positive note, uh, we thought, well, look, there is an opportunity here to, amongst other things, uh, promote access to justice. So thank you. That's from us. 
Thank you, Luke. Um, much appreciated. Sounds like a, a lot was discussed in the time um, you had available. So that's Apologies. Fantastic. Yes, I probably went on for too long. No. No, 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 you didn't, not at all. Um, everyone's been actually keeping to really good time, so I, I do appreciate that. But it, just in terms of the, the depth of discussion, that sounds fantastic. And um, we actually have two more presentations. So next up is Roundtable 5, um, Professor Tanya Sudan. Thanks very much. I don't know whether you're seeing me on the video or not. Probably not, Liria. I think I... We can see you and hear you. Oh. So you are oh. you are live. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, well, I, I want to thank everybody in, in my group because we, we had the same sort of technological difficulties as some others did. And I really want to thank everybody for the contributions that they made in terms of our group. And, and we have got that background canvas document and I really encourage you to have a look at it. Um, Lyria was part of that group, so I want to, want to thank her for her contributions. Uh, I suppose in terms of the where are we now question, we started off really looking at what's happening in law schools, but then everybody really had a consensus that the conversation needed to be broadened beyond lawyers. And there was a bit of a discussion about how you break down the silos so that uh, university education uh, incorporated people with a range of different skill sets who could then work together within teams. And so a, a, a really significant missing piece we thought in terms of conversations about the, the future RAC uh, workforce <clears throat> was about how we think beyond um, disciplines. We also had a little bit of conversation about uh, training for the existing workforce and around what that might look like at a postgraduate level or at some other level. And then there was some other conversation about whether or not we expect that lawyers are going to be doing the coding. Um, but I, I, there was a, a divergence of views around that and I think some thought that, it, you know, it's helpful if uh, lawyers know how to code, but at the end of the day, they wouldn't be doing coding. Now, that wasn't a consensus view in that others considered that, yes, lawyers would be playing a more important role into the future. In relation to the going forward and the recommendations, there was a, a, a strong view expressed that um, there needed to be a much closer link with legislative drafters and in particular the um, CALC which of course has co-sponsored the forum and, and this idea that you would link legislative drafters so that there was a way of beginning to discuss how these cross-disciplinary um, teams could work. Uh, the idea of uniting students from different disciplines in one course where they collaborate on projects but with different disciplinary specific modules was really perceived as the best way forward in terms of education. And then there was some discussion around um, having rules and basic regulations around what AI could do for the future and what it could not do is really critical. So it wasn't really just focusing on the rules as code, but the broader issues that exist in the system. Um, it, it was really um, less about working out a rule book for the future, but more about trying to identify what kind of education future leaders might need. And in relation to guiding principles, uh, I think that the group had consensus that different approaches work for different jurisdictions and that there should be no uniform approach to rules as code. And that if there was a more uniform approach, there was a danger of stifling innovation that might otherwise take place. However, the group also thought that there was some yes, that there should be some consistency in terms of guiding principles. Um, in terms of opportunities for future collaboration, um, there was quite a lot of discussion about, you know, opp opportunities to collaborate, student competitions, potentially development of a series of modules that could be used more broadly. The idea, though, of very much bringing students together in these multidisciplinary teams so that they could, if you like, extend this work as well into the future. And probably the last comment was really about a quality forum in relation to uh, education that's currently happening. So I think that's really a desire um, amongst groups to get back together again, talk about what works well and talk about what they might do differently. So that's that's my bit, Liria. I do want to thank, thank everybody in my group and uh, apologise for those disruptions that occurred on the way through as well. Um, people behaved extraordinarily well under the circumstances. 
Thank you, Tanya, and thank you for managing the conversation in all of the technical circumstances and in fact for all the conversation leaders as we went in and out of um, plenaries and subgroups and videos and, and, and all the other issues. Um, but that, Tanya in particular, because I got to witness that one, that was brilliantly led. So thank you. Um, now we all know that the best part of going to a conference is not the conversations you have in the rooms, it's the conversations you have outside of them. Um, and they're not usually presented formally, but um, on this occasion, um, we would love to welcome um, Professor Graham Greenleaf to present the hallway. Yeah, thanks, Lyria. Uh, yeah, well, Pia uh, had to leave early, so she asked me to put in uh, a few comments from our somewhat truncated corridor room. Um, and one of the points of the discussion sort of came out of the fact that the free access to law movement has had a lot of success over the last 30 years in creating around the world free access to primary legal materials and also to lots of expert commentary. But now the big danger is that this sort of third stage of digital representation of law, in other words, the, the application of rules as code to actually answer questions and uh, reach conclusions, that this is going to be left out of the development of free access to law. And we're at risk of going back to where we were 30 years ago with monopolization of legal information uh, by government and by big business, including big publishers, accountants, lawyers, etc. cetera. Uh, and so there, there is a need in the discussions about rules as code to keep in mind that at least some part uh, should be in the public domain and that we should be trying as much as possible to make the representations of legal rules as code be something that's as broadly accessible and reusable um, as possible. And as, as part of that, one of the main points that Pia was particularly interested in bringing to the plenary session was that there's a particular responsibility of governments when they develop rules as code applications that they put the codification of the law in this sense out there in the public domain not its operationalization in government decision making systems but the actual legal rules the code base um, put it out there for other people to use and thereby contribute to building up some degree of sort of public domain content. Um, there was also discussion in, in the corridor about um, to what extent you could have one representation um, of uh, the rules uh, as, you know, the law as we now understand it but also operating as code and whether you could write uh, one representation that would serve both as the human version and the coded version and there were differences of opinion about that and but it was a thought it was a worthwhile thing to try and achieve and see how close we could get to achieving it anyway i'll stop there Thank you, Graham, and, and thank you for taking that, that spot too to summarise um, the really important conversations that were happening um, in, in the corridor as, as you framed it. Um, look, thank you everybody um, for staying with us. Um, it's been a long morning here. I imagine it's been an even longer evening in Europe um, as we head into, um, you know, even past the middle of the night. Um, thank you in particular to everybody who um, who spoke, um, um, to, to Professor Murray Hildebrand, to Pia Andrews at the start.